The views and opinions in this program are not those of CESA 7 or Spectrum. Welcome to a Board of Education work session, December 6th, 2021. Uh, we will start with roll call. Beth, if you could help us with that, please. Welch. Here. Smith. Here. Leighton and Warren. Here. McCoy. Here. Warren. Here. Vanden Heuvel. Here. All right, we have six board members present tonight. Uh, Andrew Becker is excused uh, for another conflict. Um, next on the agenda, we have an opportunity for public participation with open forum. Beth, did we have anyone who registered for tonight's meeting? There are no um, individuals who registered. Okay, thank you. All right, then we will move on to item number three, which is uh, GBAP's facility and uh, the master facilities master planning process. Uh, this is a carryover from the operations uh, committee meeting. Um, and they uh, talked about the need for a facilities master plan. The presentation that was uh, shared is attached to tonight's agenda um, and, and really just uh, gives us an opportunity to uh, take a look at our facilities throughout the district. Where are we currently from a financial standpoint and what is our plan going forward? And so uh, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to uh, listen to presentations from two separate companies who can assist us with this process. Um, I believe they responded to an RFP and uh, have been selected by the admin team as kind of the two finalists. Um, so the process will be uh, the first uh, presentation will happen here shortly. We'll have the ability to ask questions at around six o'clock, we'll have the presentation from the next uh, group. Um, at the end, we won't vote um, as a board tonight. Um, if you have any specific feedback, we can provide that to the administrative team or to myself. Um, and then whatever the recommendation is from the board based upon some other factors, um, we will vote on it officially uh, at our meeting next Monday. So um, with that, Steve, I'll hand it over to you in case you have anything, and then you can introduce our first presenters. Absolutely. Well, we appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, we did add the uh, um, slide deck from the Operations Committee meeting. So if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that, uh, that gives us some overview collectively for us and for our uh, general public stakeholders about what a facilities master plan is, why you go about doing it. Uh, and uh, what you think about in terms of the selection of a partner. Uh, and uh, as Eric said, uh, we did put out a request for qualifications. Uh, 28 different uh, entities uh, downloaded the initial request. Um, we had seven formal responses to that. We went through the evaluation process and determined that we thought two would best meet the needs of the uh, Green Bay Area Public School District in the community of Green Bay. And as Eric said, we've invited both of them in uh, to present to you today. Um, they will have some dedicated question and answer time at the end. Uh, and if you have questions as you go along, uh, you may wish to raise your hand and let them know. Uh, but we'll also want to make sure that we give them adequate time that they're able to complete their presentation. And then uh, please, uh, as you take notes on that, uh, I and other members of the administrative team will be reaching out to you over the course of the next uh, week to get uh, additional information and feedback from you. And then uh, we hope to uh, come to you next Monday uh, with a presentation of a finalist. So with that, uh, I will queue up our first uh, group. We have uh, BLDD Architects. I will allow them to introduce themselves here in a moment. Uh, but again, let you know that uh, we went through the process with them. We've had several opportunities to interact with them as an administrative team uh, and do some preliminary Q&A with them. 
Uh, we hope that through that, they're well-versed on uh, who we are and what we're up to here in Green Bay. And uh, with that can provide some context for the work that they think that they would be able to do to strengthen uh, the development of our facilities master plan. So John, I think I'm turning it over to you and I'll allow you to go ahead and introduce your team and get them uh, up and rolling. Well, hello, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me well? A little bit louder perhaps. Mm. My uh, headphones just went off. And I do need to share my screen if I can. And Beth should have opportunity for you to do that, so you should be all set. Still says host disabled participation screen sharing. Just okay. There it is. I got it. Excellent. We have that live here, John. Perfect. Still trying to get my headphones to work, but maybe I won't make that work. Can you hear me well enough? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to present to you today. We truly feel we are the one team that has the systems and products in place to help you develop a long range facilities master plan for the future that will stand up to the highest scrutiny. Because what you're doing is important and it's extremely important to them. And we feel we are the one team that can help you get it right for them. And so what you're already doing is huge, right? You're already trying to keep 107,000 constituents happy. You've got 4.2 million square feet that you're having to try to take care of and trying to teach and help learn 19,000 plus students. That's big. So it's our expectation that you have some pretty strong feelings probably going into this process. My guess is, and by a raise of hands, I hope some of you are very excited about the opportunities that could come out of this. I hope that's the case. My guess is also that there might be some nervousness that goes along with this as well. And really, I think there probably, it's fair to say that there should be some angst moving into this because it will be a lot of work. But let me be clear, it'll be a lot of work for us, but it will be under a lot of scrutiny as well. But I wanna put your mind at ease. Who we are and what we do is different. We work with school districts like yourself all the time. We will be with you hand in hand throughout the entire process. We're the one team that can provide you data-driven results that can clearly show you how to proceed as a school district moving forward. Let me say that again. BLDD is the one team that can help you do that. So let me introduce you to that team of experts that can help that happen. First, I'll start with myself as John Whitlock, as the project leader, I'm your advocate. I'm the one that's making sure that all your needs are being met. I'm also organizing the effort of these great experts that I'm about to introduce. So I'm organizing their efforts as well. Damien Schlitt, as an educational programmer, will do a deep dive into your curriculum, how you address it currently, now, and in the future as a part of a visioning process. Jessica Whitlock, will act as our communication planner. One, taking all of the information that we, that we derive, taking all the gobbledygook that architects like to talk and say and make ourselves feel smart and turn that into something very palatable that can be digested easily by you, the school board, the district, and your constituents. And finally, Todd Cerulek, as an educational planner, is a absolute master at doing these sort of things. Taking all of that information that's gathered by Damien, and through the community engagement process with Jess to develop master plan scenarios for your consideration. And we will do this today. What I want you to take away three things away from today's um, presentation, that our process is time tested and extremely successful for districts just like yourself. That we, and in order to get a deep understanding for ourselves will help you understand where you are today, whether it's your existing facilities, your exec existing educational planning, but helping you understand what our starting point is. And also the one team that can provide you objective results instead of subjective, providing you again, data-driven results so that you can see the clear path for your school district moving forward. All right, can you all hear me too? Yes. Very good. Well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Jessica Whitlock and as John mentioned, this process that 
BLDD is ready to undertake with you as one that has been developed over the last 30 years, knowing that as educational architects, we needed to help districts like Green Bay, who have these extremely big problems, address them. It's something that is a generational undertaking, essentially, for you. It's not something you do every day, um, but it's something that we do multiple times every year with districts large and small. Now, the goal of your master plan is for you to be able to set a vision up for your community, for your board, for you as a board, and uh, for your staff, and for your kids so that your buildings are supporting what you want to accomplish. And the way we go about doing that is essentially to just break it down into three kind of big buckets. First off, we want to understand where you are now. And that means starting by defining what you want to accomplish. Is this a plan that you want to address for 10 years worth of your facilities? Is it one that should go for 20 years? Do we want to look at all your buildings or just, you know, elementary, middle, high? We'll get together with a group of folks from your leadership team, from the board, community leadership, staff, and even students with um, to form a leadership committee that defines those strategic objectives that you're going to start with. Once that is off and going, we're going to do an assessment of where you stand now. And um, Damien's going to go into a lot more detail about that. But then it's time for us to bring the community on board to say, where do we want to go? Um, there are lots of exciting directions that this could take. And, um, and this is the best part of the process, getting down and figuring out where this is going to go. And then eventually it becomes, how do we get there? And this is something that's really important to involve the community in the development of the solution, the evaluating of the options and deciding on where you want to end up or how you want to get there. Because when a community helps build a plan like this, if they don't build it, any of us are, that would, would be critical of something like this. But when a community helps build something, they are going to help make it come to life. We know you have big goals and your community can be right there alongside you. So um, one of the best parts of the work that we get to do is helping a community brand themselves as, as we tackle some of this stuff. And in our conversation with your leadership team last week, um, you know, talking with Lori, we, we know she's already very busy. Um, <laughs> there's no shortage of work ever for a communications director in a school district. Um, so our team is prepared to help brand this and communicate with um, your constituents through the press and through your social media channels and your website to make sure that your community is informed. But best of all, to help create a vision that says to your community, we're tackling this together. What you see here is a, a logo from the Iowa City School District. And not unlike Green Bay, they had um, you know, different parts of their community that had different goals, right? There was the similarity of, of East and West. And, um, it was just important to get everybody on the same page. These meetings sometimes scare school districts because we know we're getting a very large group of people together. But what is great about BLDD's process is that it's kind of in three, three pieces. Each of these meetings, people get to come and learn. They get to have a voice and they get to make a choice in each of the large community meetings. Um, but voice doesn't mean letting people stand up and take the microphone and take over a meeting. Voice means sitting down at a small table with eight of your community members and coming to consensus, not agreeing, but saying, what's our best next step for this particular work activity? And we'll go through that um, for four meetings throughout there and then let everybody report out and, and hear how the rest of the community saw that meeting. Um, there's some, also some great opportunities to engage virtually right now as well. Um, that last picture you saw was also Iowa City. And just to kind of wrap it up, this was a community that had not supported a referendum of this scale ever. And um, through this community engagement process, the 
support was given so that the district could develop and implement um, a 10-year master plan that updated their facilities in ways that was really um, impactful for their students and their community. For Green Bay, I know you all are probably some of the most passionately loyal um, folks that I've ever run into. I mean, we've worked with Big Ten, you know, cities in Big Ten schools and state capitals, and, and Green Bay does a great job of embracing this. And so I'm excited to get to know your community through a process of, we'll start by getting in and, and getting all the information we need. And then essentially what you're looking at is a graphic that shows these red dots would be our large community meetings. The orange dots are that facilitation team that we talked about earlier, that kind of leadership group that would help guide in between. We know that you've got um, an opportunity to ask for some public permission in October or November. And so we, we really do believe that this schedule is doable to garner the kind of input and support over the next um, nine to 10 months to make that happen. So, just kind of wrapping this up. We hope that you can see that the, the benefits of our master plan are that we really are going to give you something at the end of it that helps you understand where you wanna go for the future. Um, that it's driven by some really great data and allows you to move forward with confidence um, about the community support at the end of it. And the first, the second step, once you know what that is, is getting a deep understanding of where you stand now. So Damien, if you want to take over from there. Absolutely, thanks so much, Jess. So BLTD has realized that really the architecture that we like to provide for you and that we kind of passionately do day to day is really a, su a supporting actor to the main show, which is really the reason that your district and all districts exist, which is educating kids. Um, that's really the, the root of it all. And really where our work assessing your current needs and future goals uh, begins. Um, our firm really thrives on this deep understanding of the educational programming. And what it does is it starts to allow us to talk with your experts in-house to begin to create, which you can see here on the screen, which are draft educational standards. These again are created between our team working with, with your in-house experts to understand what goals and aspirations your district has so that we can make sure these programs support your education system going forward. The first piece of kind of assessing once we've set some of those goals is, is assessing really where the facilities are and supporting that. So defining those educational standards, our team works to evaluate each facility to identify really how well it is currently meeting or most often struggling to meet those desired standards. Um, this results in a gap analysis, and this is a key to making sure that we get the most out of all of the existing infrastructure and identifying the opportunities that exist at every site. It's very hands-on. It's both an accounting measure, so we can get that baseline information, but also a creative exercise, trying to think of new ways that we can use really some facilities you might've had a, a particular use for, for, for many years. So once those gaps are discovered, uh, the analysis can, can chart what is needed to make a facility meet your standards. Uh, for some facilities, it might be a little remodeling. Uh, for others, it could be a complete change of purpose or even realignment uh, of grades. Uh, most of the time though, every building can be added to or remodeled to meet that standard. Um, now, whether that makes financial or geographical sense, that, that'll be a conversation for one of our other phases. Uh, but this activity also adds a layer of credibility. Um, it allows the community to see that every single facility is being treated with the same level of, of care and depth of understanding to see how it can properly support your district for years to come. Now to pull this all together, you know, both the educational standards that we've put into place as well as that gap analysis, um, we found it really important to be able to easily communicate this both to your stakeholders and internally, but also constituents and taxpayers is to pull it together into one, if you will, understandable figure or metric. Um, the functional performance score actually grades each of your facilities. And you can see on the screen here, a few over to the right uh, comparative to one another. 
and, and really looks at how well facilities are functioning as schools. Uh, we use a tool developed by the Association for Learning Environments, and this grades a school on how well it's supporting education. Um, in a 99 question survey, it covers six different categories. Now those range from things like the school site, um, even the infrastructure that's in place, how easy it is to maintain for your staff and the district as a whole, a really important one, safety and security, both keeping people out, but also getting people out of facilities, how well it allows you to deliver your education within that facility. Is it flexible? Is it easy to um, realign year to year? And the educational environment, how well do students feel comfortable within the space? So that score allows everyone to compare each building to one another or to look at a composite of your whole school system. I um, mean, this example below, um, you can see the composite score across the district is a 54.9 out of a, a count of 100. So what that means is the average function of the district facilities is in that borderline category, which based on this grading criteria means that most of the district's buildings are struggling to meet your needs today. And in order to uh, support those needs growing and changing into the future, we'll probably need some, some major investments uh, to support those future learners. Now in isolation, it's just a score, but it is a very good comparative tool. Um, and it'll be a great baseline to compare ideas against. And again, I just, I wanna make sure this is clear. It gives us a very simplified metric for the community as well as our planning team to quickly understand functional performance of those district facilities. Now, while that was an overall score for the district and that has some great value, it's also backed by that granular understanding similar to earlier when we were talking about the gaps analysis. Um, again, quickly and easily understood grade comparing the functional performance of each of your facilities. You can see here the example is actually from Iowa City, where those blue bars are showing the, the existing or the status quo um, functional adequacy at the point of that grading. Now, to this point, we've talked a lot about the assessments of how facilities are working and functioning to support your programs. Um, while that's the direction we, we really um, strive and thrive for to, to uh, base our master planning around. We do understand that there are facilities and they have limitations or opportunities just by being part of the built environment. Um, so it's really about creating this very detailed understanding of your physical conditions. Um, as you can see in this example here, this is from uh, Decatur Public Schools uh, down in central Illinois. Um, a thorough assessment identifies everything that you need to know about the condition, and potential costs of owning a particular facility, not only today, but over that 20, 30 year master plan. Um, this really is the second most impactful item behind that delivery of your education. It plays a major role in, in any master plan success, both in how well it performs, but also in its success um, and support from the community. Now this is a detailed accounting of those physical needs. It's everything from roofs, exterior windows, but even full systems like heating and cooling, or even plumbing. Go ahead. And then one last piece, if we didn't have enough information to work from here, is really an understanding of building utilization. And this is one of the things that we as a firm kind of pride ourselves on is, is getting the most from each and every facility. Um, our team would spend time understanding how efficiently space is being used, and not just daily, as far as if there's kids in the building, but hourly. Our utilization tracks the use of those various spaces over time to find objective data instead of subjective opinions. So if somebody tells you this, crowd, this school is crowded or we're out of space over here, that's a little hard to define and also to solve. Um, so just as important, we can find ways to improve that utilization of existing spaces, making it possible to avoid adding or replacing spaces elsewhere um, if we can find those spaces perhaps within a building or elsewhere in the school system. So now with all this information, it might seem as if we could just, you know, go to the drawing board, if you will, and, and begin to solve um, the master plan and, and start to create that. You can see here on the left, you know, a lot of data. We could probably come up with some interesting ideas. Um, but what we really like to start is low-hanging fruit, the experts on your team, uh, but we don't stop there. 
We know that ultimately the success of any master plan, whether at your district or any across the Midwest or the country, is the ability to garner support from your stakeholders, that 50% plus one, if you will, of your voters to make substantial changes happen. Uh, so the best way to get that support is to bring that community along. Just mentioned that in the overall master planning process. And this is that part where we, we start to engage with them within that. So we know that shared success requires good communication, as Jess was touching on, and really a shared understanding of the why, not just the what's, but the why. Why are we here um, for anything to get done? So we have a process that educates and elicits that productive conversation. You can see here some, some initial work activities. And what these do is they allow us to start or stop guessing at what people are thinking and start quantifying and, and reading and asking and finding out. So this is a quick activity and a kickoff meeting where really, you know, from the offset, we can understand the, the feelings of the community about current facilities, that chart on the left in the word cloud. People are pretty clear, unsafe, outdated, uh, smelly or disrepaired buildings. Um, on the right, though, those aspirations, some very subjective words, but it starts to give us a feel for what the direction is that, that this dis district was looking for in their solutions. But beyond those subjective items, um, and we know a lot of data internally for our functions, our physical needs, we also need to quantify and understand the vision of our community. We might have the, some great ideas you know, at the board table or as an administrative team, but it's, this is a great chance to understand priorities and even various decision drivers that might um, cause you know, success or failure in any, any plan. Also, our goal is in all of this to, to provide it and to go through these work activities in a way where it's quantifiable. because that gives a quantity to a very qualitative subject. Uh, these priorities then become scorecards. So we can now, as we look forward and we, we can look back to this work and see and use them as scorecards for those um, ideas to be judged moving forward. Another key piece of, of the engagement piece, which will have a lot of understanding of data, as I've touched on, but it, and it's a key to success, but just as importantly, avoiding failure um, is finding those landmines, finding those no-go items um, through polls and exploration exercises, like the a couple examples I showed before. Um, we can really understand what are the things that are going to make any plan, no matter how great it sounds, fail. Uh, one example for um, is actually Decatur Public Schools. You know, all signs were leading towards, you know, efficiency, effectiveness, delivery of education that, you know, one high school was what made sense for the district. Um, you know, great plans at the administrative level and even through some of the planning with, with our team. But really, as we went to the community, we found that regardless of cost or any of those benefits that we could show them, you know, keeping two high schools online was, was a key, a key um, contributor to success of any plan for them. So this community engagement process is what actually made that, that happen. So while gathering information, uh, communicating the why and uncovering those no-go decisions, um, really beyond uncovering those landmines, one of the most impactful parts is actually giving that authorship to the community. And that's something that Todd's going to touch on here in a second. Yes, um, as someone who's been doing this for 25 years, it wasn't long before I, I started that I realized getting in a room with a great board of education, a great team of administrators, and coming up with a plan that the community would rally around and support both um, emotionally, but at the ballot box so you could actually make it happen was really sort of a thing of the past. So the, the father knows best era of uh, governing was really closing in the, in the 1990s. And what we found uh, has really become a boon to getting not only support, um, but actually a deep understanding as Jessica mentioned, ownership uh, requires giving up a little bit uh, of that authorship. Because once you bring the community to literally to the table, as you can see in this image, and let them roll up their sleeves, and once they've got the information that Damien just spoke of, they can get down to work and come up with ideas that are in sheer volume 
more than uh, just a group of, of um, uh, board members or administrators could ever dream of. So as, as you begin to involve the community, they will do their job. Uh, everyone likes to play architect. And, and if you can imagine, you know, hundreds of people gathered around in small groups uh, around a table trying to solve something as complex as a school district, uh, you're going to get a lot of ideas. So the wonderful thing about this is you get all the ideas out there in the public. Uh, the less wonderful thing about it is you get all the ideas out there uh, for everyone to see and, and think about. So it's very important, and we've talked about process a lot, but the, really the processes are there to reinforce and, and make a productive effort out of what otherwise could be a little chaotic. So taking these options, letting them see the light of day, and then letting the community tackle uh, alongside us and you uh, how to bring these uh, variety of ideas down to the best ideas and really begin to get those deep dives to understand what that looks like. An example here is at Iowa City. Uh, I think we've talked about it a couple times here, but um, this, is, this is what a scenario looks like. John mentioned the word scenario early on there, and you've seen it pop up. Um, that is our way of collecting the different options or a variety of options together and putting them as one solution or one possible future for, for your community. And this is, uh, these would all be giant pages or, or uh, uh, part of a, a presentation so people could actually look and, and begin to understand the idea uh, at a deep level on their own. And more importantly, see the work that they did at the last meeting coming forward in this meeting. So as you bring these, these pieces online, um, you begin to see there are some great ideas that begin to, to evolve down to that one or two great solutions. In a previous slide, we showed that conditions, uh, the, the functional performance of a variety of buildings, I believe at Iowa City. This is a little different one, but this was the, the leading idea uh, at St. Joseph. And what you wanna see here is that these six uh, buildings that are in a white bar on this uh, project, those were actually some older, uh, very small elementary schools. And then you see the, the three uh, all yellow bars. It was decided that it would be the, in the best interest in this scenario to close these smaller schools and rebuild them as larger combined schools in the right areas. Uh, that's great. New schools are are always gonna perform well. But I think the important thing is bringing these options back to the table and looking at when you did all the remodeling and the additions, you actually raised all the levels of the schools into that satisfactory level, which means that every student is getting an equitable and quality educational experience. So we'll revisit this a little bit later. Um, the other thing that, that's extremely important is you close in on the end of a master plan. We're talking about coming down to the, the best options. Very important that you understand how that money can be uh, spent over time. As interesting it is, when you talk about two, three, four hundred million dollar master plans, as exciting as it is, uh, it's going to take some time not only time to get the money in, but time to get the work built. And uh, one of the most important tools that we've developed over the years is the ability to actually in real time, uh, work with your financial advisors, work with your financial team and align the highest priority needs with the dollars as quickly as possible. Uh, and you would be amazed at the creative process that goes into aligning dollars with priorities over time. Um, but it's just a key part of every great master plan. And at the end, you have a wonderful thing. As Jessica talked about, you know, a great message. In, in this case, it was Springfield, Illinois, the, the capital. Um, they hadn't done a master plan um, uh, that actually required voter approval for uh, a generation. 
they had decided they were going to rally around these three points and everything was branded this way, really bringing a community of three high schools under the, the, the vision, uh, one vision idea was huge uh, for this. So you had beautiful um, uh, pictures and images showing the possibilities, a map showing where everybody got all these new things and, and these great documents. As a matter of fact, we left a, left a set of them there. So if you'd like to see them. So at the end, uh, this, is, this is your master plan. And this is where I would say the majority of master plans stop. And uh, you go on a sales campaign, but as John will show you, we think there's a better way. As Bob mentioned, this is where most master plans stop. And what it looks like uh, for you is that we've regurgitated all this information that we've gathered, all the information from the deep dive that Damien's working on, the, the, all the information that was um, obtained through the community engagement process. And we just sort of regurgitate that to you as a board and as a superintendent and as an administration team. And now you're left to try to figure out what you're supposed to do with it. But at BLDD, about 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, we came up with a better plan. And so we want you to feel like this guy, not the guy on the left. And I really think that that can be possible with the use of Clio, Quantified Learning Environment Outcomes. Basically, that data-driven solution scenarios helps you select scenarios based on that data comes from Clio. And let me explain kind of how that works. And this is proprietary software that only BLDD um, uses at this time. It's done during the evaluation process. In other words, we've gathered all of this information. Now, what are we supposed to do with it? Well, it's pretty simple. You're getting master plan scenarios. Todd talked about that. So that's different options for the buildings you know, up as a part of different master plans. Just to give you an example, scenario one at building A you see is yellow. That means it's being remodeled as a part of this scenario. In scenario two, another master planning option or scenario at building A, you can see that it's actually being repurposed and being utilized as something else. So we have all of these different scenarios and some of them very good scenarios. How do we determine what is the best for the district? So we look at both sides of the coin. Clio will look at life cycle costs and we call it the true cost of ownership. It includes all of the costs associated with any additions, remodelings, new buildings. So if that master plan for that building has an addition, that cost is the first cost that's in there. But it also gets into the staffing cost for that building. It gets into the utility rates of that building operation and maintenance, transportation, all the things that affects your ownership and cost of ownership over the next 20 to 30 years. All of that money and dollars is associated on this side of the coin. We call it the life cycle cost. On the other side of the coin is how well is your building providing 21st century learning and your educational plan. So it's the functional side of the coin. So now we have the cost associated with how well it functions as a school to meet your needs, be a tool that can help support your educational process instead of hinder what, it's, what you're trying to do. So the charts are pretty simple. And here's an example of, and you heard somebody mention status quo. We call status quo the do nothing option, but that's not accurate. That's where you are today. And there's a lot of deferred maintenance associated and there's the operations and maintenance associated with owning those buildings and the utilities associated with owning those buildings. So over the next 20 to 30 years, there is a cost of ownership. So there's a status quo um, solution that we compare everything to, because if we can't come up with a better solution than status quo, then we should probably all quit. But truthfully, that's our baseline. So you see in the scenario one, Life cycle costs are held pretty low, similar to status quo. Scenario two, a lot of life cycle costs. And when you flip over to the other side of the coin, the functional performance side, you see that scenario two, obviously you're spending a lot of money, so you should get a lot of educational outcomes from that. Scenario one, not as much, but you're hardly spending any. This is an obvious, very simple option or example that shows that under a cost benefit ratio, it is a very clear and obvious direction for you as a board to say, yes, that makes sense. It gives us the best educational bang for our buck. And that's what we want for you 
that's as much work as we want you to put into that is just be able to say, yeah, that's obviously the solution that we should go with. So maybe you should give an example of how this worked, Todd. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, in a very real world, actually, uh, kind of one of the reasons oh. that we built this program. Oh. <laughs> What's that? That's not good news. Oh, we're back. Oh, there we are. We're back. Okay. So, um, so when we built this program, one of the first places we used it was St. Joseph, Missouri. I mentioned that earlier. And just sort of like right now, there were there was a, a lot of of things going on and some competing interests within the community. Not uncommon, um, but through a very thorough community engagement process, the world had or the community had really gathered around at all the meetings. It just felt like scenario six was was by far. Uh, the strongest option, and everyone was was really committed to moving forward with it. Unfortunately, and this may not be true of your community, but in their community, they had a few people who maybe didn't want to show up at a meeting, but had some very strong opinions. And unfortunately, if you don't arrive at the meeting or weren't participating, those ideas really didn't get vetted in public like all the other ideas. So we looked around and and, and spent a little time on Facebook and the newspaper website and, and other places to really gather those ideas that were bouncing around Facebook and the coffee shop and, and that. And they sounded kind of credible, actually really credible. Um, why don't you just fix all 32 of our buildings? And if they need additions, put the additions on, but don't ever close any buildings. Um, sounds, sounds like something with some legs. Um, so what we did is we actually modeled it against all the other options and we called it the blog scenario and presented it at the next community meeting. As you can see, it, it has a high life cycle cost, but you can imagine that you're, you're operating more buildings where scenario six was, was closing uh, six buildings, replacing it with some new ones. But if you go to the functional side, you know, well, it doesn't look too bad. It's not as good as scenario six. Uh, obviously you don't have as many, you know, you don't have new buildings, um, but boy, you know, it, it's got some potential, but when you put it through Clio, it showed a very, very telling thing is that not only was the blog scenario, not as good as scenario six, the preferred scenario of most of the community, it was actually worse than doing nothing. It was a worse investment. You were going to spend more and receive less educational functionality uh, in the long run. So at that point, the community um, felt like we're going to go with scenario six and the sort of noise in the background began to die down because number one, it was evident. And number two, it was done and discussed and shared in public, which is really something that, that needs to happen today more than, than ever. Oh, and in conclusion, we hope and in our limited amount of time with you, we hope that you've seen that we have a process that is shown to be extremely successful for districts just like yourself. That we will work extra hard to have a very deep understanding, not only for us in the process, but for you of where you are today with your physical needs of your buildings and your functional performance of those buildings as well and gathering all that uh, preliminary information. And then by providing Clio proprietary software that BLDD brings to the table, it will provide you objective results versus the subjective, the architect who says, in my professional opinion, this is what you should do. We will never do that. We will bring you objective results that will make it very simple for you to do your job. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for our 40 minutes. I hope we didn't go over um, and open it up for questions. All right, uh, questions for Jason and his team. Go ahead, Brenda. Can you describe some of the criteria that you use to determine functional performance of the district or the, and the schools? So I'll let Damien take that. Yeah, so we sit down typically with the facility administrator at that building and depending on the division of, of types of facilities, we might do a, an elementary team and a middle school team, high school team. And we actually sit down and there's a, a 99 question survey, if you will, to go through. Now, those categories I was mentioning earlier relative to site, 
functionality, um, uh, infrastructure, those types of things. Within each of those are questions particular to kind of the functionality day in and day out. So some examples are flexibility. Does the facility have the ability to be flexible for changes in educational delivery? Um, are there varied sizes of spaces? You know, we know that an AP history class may not have 32 kids. So is their ability to perform and provide that course um, in a more properly sized space? Again, to increase your utilization of your overall facility, but um, also to put that, uh, that class into a, a better suited space. So those criteria are not necessarily intended to be comparative between your district and maybe a district down the road, but they're really about us creating a common understanding as a team um, internally, and then that we can you know, communicate outward of, of where those facilities relate um, to one another um, as a very objective scoring. Hopefully that touched upon. I've got more examples of questions if you're interested, but I want to make sure I was hitting there question. Um, I guess you mentioned uh, providing learning and educational outcomes. So are these criteria that you're using based on um, other places that have had better educational outcomes because of flexibility or, you know, uh, better use of space? <clears throat> So the criteria were actually created by the Association for Learning Environments. It's a um, international consortium, if you will, of educational planners. And that scoring metric was defined from that, where upon numerous studies over the past, I believe the scoring is tw about 20 years old, 19 now, I think, where that development was made, where it was not necessarily about um, guaranteeing a test score, but it was about creating an educational environment that gave the most flexibility to students to be able to learn and be comfortable and uh, be engaged with their education, but also the educators to be able to deliver varied education from, you know, lecture seats and rows all the way to small group work, um, large group work, those types of things, hands-on learning. So that's where that criteria came from um, was international studies relative to those types of spaces. Okay, thanks. Yep. <clears throat> um, I have a question. Um, I, I'm not familiar with, uh, I was glancing through your website and some of the districts that you talked about. I don't, don't um, not familiar with all of them. So I'm just curious, how does your process change or, or stay the same for a large urban district uh, like Green Bay versus um, you know, maybe a suburban district or a smaller district, is it kind of the same process or are there unique parts uh, that uh, would apply to us? Bob, does it make sense that you go with that? Yeah, uh, actually th that was um, one of the, the things when we, we very uh, early started this, worked with a lot of suburban districts that had a lot of fast growth um, in, especially in the, the sort of Midwest, um, area. And very quickly we realized, uh, probably about 15 years ago, that scalability was huge. Uh, where a three, three meeting, uh, should we build a new middle school, uh, versus should we add on to the high school and look at a junior, senior high program? Very different from working with Springfield, which is, um, you know, a very political town, has a lot of high poverty, a lot of diversity in a lot of different neighborhoods. So working uh, together, uh, Jessica, myself, and some others, you're creating this, this overall process, those three buckets, and then scaling it um, in a tailored way for the problem to be solved. So obviously you have a, a lot of square foot per student currently. Uh, you also have a lot of, of diversity and, and, and equity um, as populations have shifted around your community. So one of the first things we'll do is sit down and say, okay, where, where are the problems that have to be solved? Uh, and be able to actually create, whether uh, at Springfield, it was a group of, of leaderships really to just set that vision and then we did a second wave that was actually the master planning. 
I believe Iowa City was a little different because we did a lot of group, a lot of um, steering committee work because uh, there were just certain tough d- discussions that that weren't ideal for sort of an all community meeting. So um, I guess uh, to to put it succinctly, it's a very tailor made uh, uh, delivery on what is a very uniform process uh, of, of best practices. Thank you. Um, one more question. Um, when you talked about the, the functional audit, um, would that be done of all district facilities? So I think about the district office building, the, the food service, uh, um, is that comprehensive of every building that the district occupies or is it just schools? So typically I'll relate to student occupied facilities because it's about delivery of education. Um, however, the, the breadth, all buildings are included within the physical needs and would have an impact on that. So relative to, as John, I believe was mentioning in Clio with um, staffing costs and transportation, some of those types of things, the impacts of having those as standalone facilities would certainly show up in those types of factors. But as a functional score, um, they're typically based on student occupied facilities and how education is being directly delivered. Okay, so the, the functional scores are for the school buildings, but in the overall assessment, you'd be considering all of Correct. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Laura. Um, hi, my name is Laura McCoy. Um, my question to you, and, and we've kind of touched on this already a little bit. Um, we talked a lot about processes, but uh, in Green Bay, um, we, we have a lot of diversity, um, whether or not that's... Uh, special ed are our families of color and we honor and we value that diversity. Um, how important to your process is it to take into consideration um, like the mission statement of a school like ours? Um, it's, you know, to me, it's important to hire a company that knows how to embed um, those values into their final plan. Do you look at that? How do you, how do you, um, how do you respond to uh, things like a mission statement and the the values of a school district? Yes, does it make sense for you to chime in? Sure, I can take that. Those those values, Green Bay's values, you, you know, your education, excellence, equity, those stand out, and they should be front and center as a part of every single conversation. Um, We have done that over and over again, like with Springfield comes up again, as I think about one recently, um, you'll notice that both from the very beginning, it was part of our communications and still at the very end that we say, if, if their goal was equity across the district, um, the, one of the primary goals in their output was that all of their buildings would provide equitable um, opportunities for students. And so it's essential, I would say, Laura, for that to be right front and center um, from the get-go as part of our communications, that your community understands what's important to you as a board and that they can embrace that as part of the planning process. Actually, um, can I... Can I clarify, uh, w- was that about how do individual schools um, basically not lose their identity, to rephrase that question, in a master planning process? No, no, this is an okay. overall philosophy and, and um, like I said, mission statement that, that we all live by and work by and value um, in our community and in our, in our school district. Uh, and I just, it's the kind of thing that is embedded into all the work that we do. And I just mm-hmm. wanted to, so in order, when we hire a company, um, they need to know that and understand it and align their work to that. That's kind of where I was getting at. It is I don't extremely wanna, important to align. Yeah, I don't mean to, I'm not trying to pile on here, <laughs> but I think really important piece to that, that early gap analysis and, and ed standard that's, that's really an opportunity where we can start to put solutions to some of that as well. Um, having the same exact programs at every building doesn't necessarily mean there's equity at every building. So understanding what one facility might need to solve 
um, you know, students resources and social work and those types of things versus another facility is a really important factor. So it's not just creating a, a standard flat water markets, creating that equity with that. So that's one tangible. Um, there's also in that functional assessment piece where we can start to understand, are we providing all services to, to all of our different populations throughout the district? That's another portion where it can become, if you will, rooted within, within the work. Thank you. Go ahead, Brenda. Um, I'm wondering, I'd, I'd like to, I'm we're, sorry. I'm interested in hearing um, a tough challenge that you've been through. And one of the things that I'm uh, particularly interested in is have you had situations where at the, toward the end, you have two or three scenarios, they all have the same cost benefit ratio. You've got, um, you know, the community has not come together to identify the solution that they like. Um, how do you move forward in something like that? Or if you have another tough scenario you'd rather share, I'm open to that. <laughs> uh, does that make sense? Do you want to? Yeah, that? sure. Um, yeah, a couple of stories come to mind. Um, I'll start with a real quick one. It, it, it really doesn't fit with, with Green Bay um, as much as, as it just shows that you have to be malleable in these um, approaches when you begin. Uh, we started one in a, a little little community. It was two, two towns that were consolidated into a, a school district. And it was very apparent as we went into the first meeting and you started you know, engaging folks that um, they weren't sure they wanted to stay together, much less do anything. So uh, at that point, we called an audible and said, okay, pause. Um, next, next meeting was going to be about, um, you know, 21st century learning or future focused learning. Instead, it's going to be, do you really want to remain together? <laughs> uh, and that, and, and went through a couple of meetings exploring the, the benefits of the consolidated district and the sharing of resources and the, what that does for children. Um, so that was, that was a big one. Uh, Cause you had some people pretty, pretty um, frustrated those that were excited to get to work and those that wanted to rehash really a 30 year old decision. Um, but, you know, being willing to hit the, to, to adjust this, the program and the schedule based on the facts on the ground is extremely important. St. Joseph, I don't want to keep hitting that one, but um, we had a kind of a sticky situation. As you saw, we closed six buildings. Four of those were in predominantly minority portions of the St. Joseph community and, and had the highest needs as far as student uh, programs and student um, needs. So very early on, um, I believe it was the second of a six meeting um, agenda. Uh, there was a large contingent of, of folks that were very loud and, and prominent voices uh, in those communities that said, you can't do this to our, our neighborhood. This will be the end of our neighborhood. Um, the exciting thing with that is through this process where we said, well, you know, if you can, if you can dispel, um, you know, making a decision, or delay making a decision about the process for just a moment and really go through it, you know, I think we'll, we'll come there. And by the end of it, that community had decided um, it, it, very importantly that not only were they um, in favor, they were really wanted to make sure that their communities received the new buildings and, and um, or at least one of them and one of the most important things is it allowed a site that had kind of been neglected uh, called the Devil's Hillside. Uh, as you can imagine, a little bit of a, an elevation change of 300 feet actually became the site of one of the new elementary schools because of its proximity to those um, uh, historically um, uh, most in need neighborhoods. And it really was the linchpin. So it went from something that could have you know, potentially, um, you know, de derailed uh, a process to one that made it even stronger. So that's that's the power of engagement uh, that 
makes me want to run into it headlong every time. So. Brenda, you, um, those were really good examples, Todd. I think of some challenges that were hit early on. You talked about when a couple of scenarios might have had similar cost benefit ratios and how we handle that too. Um, really quickly, there was one recently that we were a part of that had um, an option. It was a two town district and it had an option for a high or a middle school um, to go in one of those towns. And it was definitely a neck and neck within some of the meetings for cost benefit analysis. So the way that we went about that was, is we just asked the community in the next community meeting, when we realized those things were really close together as far as cost benefit goes, we said, okay, which one of these could you support wholeheartedly? We asked every single person in the room this question as actually a part of a digital survey. Which one of these options could you support wholeheartedly? Which one of these could you just support? You'd still support. I mean, it wouldn't be your first option, but which one could you still support? And which one would you not support? So what comes out of that is, again, some data that you can use as a board that tells you, okay, none of these are perfect because none of your uh, scenarios are ever going to be completely perfect to make everyone happy. But if the cost benefit ratio is close, that's another data point that you can explore. And then, you know, you give weighted point system to that and go, okay, this could lead us in the right direction. You add that to a, a community poll, a, you know, a, a separate poll outside of this to see where people fall. And that, that gives you quite a bit of coverage to help understand where people land with things. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we are coming up on our time um, with BLDD. Thank you uh, very much for the presentation, for answering our questions. And uh, we'll, Steve and his team will be in touch uh, later this week. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity. We'll look forward to working with you. Bye. All right. Thanks, John. <laughs> Stretch your legs. Pardon me? Uh, I think you'll find when you talk to the next group, uh, they do different types of things. Um, there's just happens to be a proprietary software platform that we use that they build out specifically for this. Good question.
Right. Hello, Dean. Oops, I'm not hello, on. hello. Well, welcome. Uh, we appreciate uh, you and your team being with us today. Uh, and uh, we've got uh, six of our seven board members here. Uh, one of our board members is excused this evening. Uh, and uh, we've got uh, about an hour for you. I, we uh, hope to save about uh, 10 minutes uh, at the end uh, so that the board can ask questions as we go through it. Uh, but uh, we're excited for you to be here. I've walked them through the selection process and how we got to today. Uh, so without stealing any more of your time, I'm going to turn it right over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much for having us and asking us to, to join you. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. Great. Well, we are ATSR architects and engineers. Uh, we're thankful that you asked us to come this far with you, and we hope to show tonight how, uh, how well we fit with you, uh, how our past experiences can become your resources, how we are team members, listeners, and uh, we wouldn't be in business if we weren't good at what we do. So I don't know how your screen is coming up. We find if you push that little blue button, it gets rid of all the pictures of people and just keeps the active talker on. So that's up to you. I'm gonna click over to this now. So just a little tip. So my name's Dean Beninga. I am an architect. I am our president. I uh, will be the main contact for you. I am the principal in charge, uh, father of seven beautiful children. And probably the neatest thing is I married a girl from Green Bay. <laughs> so I've been in your town for 38 years, I figured, before we started dating. So um, I love Green Bay. I really do. I think it's a, a great community. And uh, it, would be, it would be wonderful to work for you. Hi, my name is Dave Maroney. I am an architect and a vice president of ATSNR. Uh, <coughs> experience working with school districts to help creatively solve the needs of their districts and uh, really recognize kind of, you know, how things tick, what makes things work. So I'm going to be heavily involved in your facility analysis and cost estimating and kind of dat data analysis. Everybody, I'm Sarah Fox. A uh, partner and designer, I will be one of the team leaders with focus on the ed analysis portion. Uh, I have worked with many of your neighbors, such as Howard Swamico, Chippewa Falls, and why we of Prima. I look forward to me working with you all. Hi, my name is Pete Lacey. I'm uh, an architect partner at ATSR and um, currently working on an education analysis and facility analysis of uh, Eau Claire School District, not too far away. Good evening, board. I'm Chuck Holden. Uh, my role is facility advisor and facilitator. Uh, 32 years, former uh, chief operation officer for Anoka Hennepin Schools in Minnesota. Currently an online grandpa virtual academy teacher. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, thanks for having us. Hi, I'm standing in for Blaine Parkos, who's unfortunately came uh, down with an illness and he's not able to be here tonight, but he is the director of our mechanical engineering department. Uh, Blaine is a partner with the firm, uh, one of the six generations of ownership of our company. And uh, he's one of the kind of my right hand when it comes to operating the uh, facility condition index system that we're going to share with you. Thanks. Thanks, Blaine. Um, and my name is Jen Miller, um, Interior Design Department um, Associate Partner, and I will be working uh, kind of hand in hand with Sarah and the team, um, making sure your spaces are right sized, future ready, um, and making sure they're an exciting space for both staff and students. Hi there, I'm Kara, and I'm a partner and interior designer also, so very similar role to Jen. Um, and you'll see us both listed as future ready specialists 
Um, it's something that we really try and look at all of our projects and make sure that we're keeping uh, future ready spaces in mind and make sure we're planning for now and in the future. So we got a full show for you tonight. Uh, you can start to see we're going to touch on who ATSR is, uh, our understanding of you. We have some large district experience very similar to you that we'd like to share a few stories about how, how they decided to do things. That doesn't mean you have to do them, um, but, but our experience is with them, which is valuable for you, we believe. Uh, the process, it's a big process to, to facilitate all the information you need to learn for us to, to gather and teach you and, and then get the community on board and understand what the community wants. So we're going to do our best at showing the process, but it's kind of a snapshot of, of a lot of the tools we use. Uh, and then really talk about the future ready learning environments that ATSR creates, this group creates. We spend a lot of time educating ourselves on what future ready is for schools. Some people call it 21st century architecture. We think that's a little limited. We try to think about the future ready. So ATSR, we're a multidiscipline firm. What that means is we are we have all the the disciplines in our firm. So mechanical, electrical, architectural, um, interiors, furniture, food service, theater design. So we have built our firm to serve the school client. So we don't have to go out and get consultants. Uh, we collaborate better that way. We're a single shop responsibility. 98% uh, of our work is in schools. So we immerse ourselves into schools. We stay current on what's going on around the world in school design. Doesn't mean you have to do it, but we try to understand it and bring it to you so that you can make the decisions. We call, uh, we call it lead, guide, and inspire. So we try to lead you, guide you, and inspire you, but you are the owners, the client. Uh, as I mentioned, we uh, are fortunate to have some very similar experience to you, your district size. It's a big, you, you have a big district, um, big thinkers. Uh, let's, let's think out of the box. Uh, how, how have you solved things before? What are some of the other ways we can look at it? Uh, and I believe we have a great understanding of your community. We are very experienced in your area. I designed Bayport High School, um, Wasa East High School, New Richmond High School. Sarah mentioned Wyawaga Fremont. Fremont, we put 21 million into that high school and really transformed it. A wonderful job. We're currently the district architect for Chippewa Falls, last 65 million worth of work and currently Eau Claire. So we're doing facility studies with uh, these groups also, and uh, it seems to be a great fit uh, for your, your project. So we understand you a little bit. We'd like to understand you more. But we understand you have 4.3 million square feet, 42 or so buildings. We understand you have a huge opportunity now with, uh, with funds, uh, needs, uh, possible, uh, possible um, you know, borrowing coming off the, off the table to be able to keep uh, any tax increases low. Uh, we understand you want to right size, you need equity. A lot of things Chuck's going to talk to you about from his Anoka School District. Uh, we understand that um, you know, you, you, you're underutilizing some buildings and other buildings you're over capacity. So how do you solve that? Uh, it's, it's a continual issue for a group uh, of your size. So we had the pleasure of meeting with some of you uh, last week. And uh, these are just some of the things that we heard as being important to you. Uh, building community trust, right sizing, best value, sustainability, and operational efficiency. 
So we think you need a firm that thinks big, thinks out of the box, helps you reinvent Green Bay schools. Uh, we got to revitalize. We got to get the energy back up. We got to get the branding set. We got to we got to make Green Bay the greatest place to go to school because it is a wonderful community, and uh, you got a lot of great things ahead. We're going to share with you now a couple stories about large group districts. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity. Again, Chuck Colden, uh, formerly from the district you're looking at in Okehennepin, uh, which is the largest district in the state of Minnesota. And when I look back a couple of slides at, at what your goals were, when we sat down and put our whiteboard up and started naming goals for Noka Hennepin's facility, um, planning, equity, right sizing, community trust, building efficiency, flexible spaces. I mean, it sounds like a mirror image. And uh, as Dean was mentioning, the opportunity, the timing is so important. We had the same situation where we had some borrowing and some debt that was being retired on new high schools and an alternative high school in Anoka and one in Champlin that allowed us um, some flexibility in our budget because we're a very conservative uh, school district and community and uh, raising taxes is never a good thing. So I understand that whole issue, but in Anoka Hennepin, I, I spent 32 years there. I started in 1987, had been a teacher and came in and, and immediately we were building schools. And with ATS NARS help, Champlain Park High School, and over elementary, Oxford Creek Elementary, several new schools because we started at that time with a population of about 23,000 students, 22, 23,000 and grew up uh, to just about 30 within 10 years. But interestingly enough, uh, we went through a period then in the 90, late 90s, early 2000s of stagnation and really dropping enrollment in the southern end of our school district and still growing, but not as quickly in the northern end of the district. So that happened. And then we really, that's when we really got into some of the tools you're going to see tonight on facility planning, trying to right size and find out where we needed classrooms, where we had surplus classrooms. We went through that whole process. And then um, just re more recently, uh, just exponential growth again to getting the school district up to almost 40,000 students and really taking off in the north, northern end of the district and the eastern end of the district and buying farm property and building high schools and so on. So um, kind of been through the gamut of up and down growth and then stagnation declining um, and dealt with all of the ec uh, equity issues that I'm, I'm sure you're presented with too. We've got an older aging community, a little more diversity in some areas and the buildings are, are showing their wear. And then we've got brand new facilities uh, where, where the demograph demographics are mostly white families and, and heard all those issues. So um, we developed a process. We had a facility use task force, got tons of community input because we had to build community trust to pass a bond and to get parents and our community leaders and our community members to understand what the issues were. And uh, we were successful with that, um, spent a lot of time with it and it was difficult, but it was also probably the most rewarding challenge I think I faced in, in my time with the school district. So uh, excited to try and bring some of that experience to, to help if I can. Dave? Dave, could I make a comment? Sure. Uh, Chuck was not in the proposal. After we met with you and learned more about you and about how some of the context that he's lived through, we thought he'd be a perfect resource to help you. So he is on the team and I'll be getting you his resume. You know, I've had the pleasure uh, of working with Chuck for about 25 years with an Okanapan. And uh, I mean, it, here's the book that Chuck's referring to. This was one of the analysis we did with that district. Um, you know, some of the declining enrollment, 
we pro uh, projected what if scenarios, what if you increase your, increase your class sizes, what if you get rid of classrooms, aka schools, a lot of different things were in the air and a lot of difficult decisions were, were made being made you know we really value the relationship that we have with an okahannapin it started 57 years ago and it's been a continuous relationship and um just seeing a lot of different dynamics with that school district another large school district that we've got some i've got some personal experience with is in uh, u46 which is in northern illinois outside of chicago and you know it's a Again, a large school district, 37,000 students. I think it's it's down right now. Uh, we've been watching it kind of ebb down a little bit here. But, you know, we were invited in, kind of the out-of-town expert, and uh, brought in and really gave them clarity. Uh, you know, we started with kind of getting on the ground, getting out to every school, conducting listening sessions. A lot of our staff participated in that. And it's just a fascinating experience when you really learn, you know, what's really working with every school, what's really not working with every school. Then, of course, we dissected the data and we went into the, you know, what are your average class sizes? How are your buildings used? You know, what's every space used for? That's the big challenge with a big district. How do you keep control of your understanding of how your facilities are used? So the process is wonderful. It, it actually is, is so enjoyable because we get to learn another story. And the story would be each of your buildings as an architect and a planner. It's really interesting to get to spend time to study a building, how it's working, how it fits to 21st century or future ready uh, architecture, you know, how the how the students feel in it, how the staff feel in it. So we uh, kind of break it down into these, uh, what we call gems process uh, and these different steps. And they're all critical and they all depend on each other. Uh, gathering the information uh, is huge. Uh, learning about your buildings, meeting, we'll go to every, if you want us to, we'll go to every school community, we're going to meet with the, and Sarah will touch on this, but we'll meet with the site-based team, which is the principal and important members of the school. And then we'll go at night and, and, and ask the community to come in and just listen to them and probe them with a few questions. But uh, gathering that information, the master schedules, the enrollment, the square footage, the heating usage, the efficiency of the <clears throat> of the spaces and putting that all together so that we can create a facts, fact book, fact document to help start to teach everybody about the conditions. So we use these tools that we're about to show you. Um, and as we step through this process. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Uh, correct. So right sizing and creating future ready, equitable learning spaces begins with the ed, ed analysis and super important. Uh, and it's part of our discovery process. Uh, this is where we like to turn over every stone, operational, functional, spatial, and environmental. So we'll meet with the district administration, uh, school building leadership, uh, user groups, if you want us to, uh, to gain knowledge about current programs, existing conditions, and to begin exploring these big ideas that may develop. We then develop a custom questionnaire that will go to each school's leadership for them to complete. And then we visit with that leadership at each school building. And this is where we'll discuss deficiencies, needs, and any initial big ideas that the leadership of these schools uh, see as you no know, potential improvements to kind of jump jump start that process, uh, and then we create that analysis package that Peter here will explain for us. So we take the information that we've learned as we visited the sites and met with the school staff, and start to. 
uh, find ways to communicate that to you. So here's an example of a, of a site plan. It shows where the heavy traffic areas are, where the parent drop off is, where the bus drop off is, where the parking is. So you can get an overall feel for how efficiently or how effectively the site is being used and whether there's any areas of concern. Here we can see that the parent drop off is in the same line as the bus drop off. And that's, that's kind of an area of concern. So uh, on the left hand side of the screen, you can see we've developed some traffic light signals, which indicate uh, areas that um, need to be looked at. So the green is good. It meets the, the adequate, it's adequately uh, sized or um, flows okay. Yellow is, could be improved, um, like separating the bus and the parent traffic. And red is that uh, that particular function is missing or is uh, needs to be addressed urgently. Uh, we then look at the master schedule for each school and we analyze classroom capacity, uh, classrooms that are underutilized, overused, and uh, we also analyze the size of each space. And again, we find ways to present that information to you. So here is a diagram of the school. It shows the different uses within the school. Uh, different colors represent the music suite or the performance areas, the gymnasium uh, and classrooms. And then we overlay on top of that, the areas that have uh, are below standards for a particular reason. We key point what those reasons are. So on the top left, left hand of, of this particular school, you can see the, the Orange classrooms have been highlighted in red to indicate that um, there's uh, demountable partitions there, which uh, uh, offer poor acoustics between the classrooms. There's interior spaces which have uh, inadequate natural lighting and uh, the, the classrooms are, themselves are undersized. So we highlight these areas that need to be addressed as we uh, start to come up with options and solutions. Thing I like about our tools, they're easy to read, easy to communicate, uh, so the community really understands uh, where the needs are happening and, and how it's shared. The um, Did you know that infrastructure accounts for about 75% of the needs of a typical district? You know, what is infrastructure? It's the stuff you can't see. It's the mechanical, it's the plumbing, it's the roof, it's the electrical systems. 75%, boy, that's what really why we started using what we um, have custom built for each of our clients is a custom built facility condition index system. It's a tool that we use, it's totally adaptable. It projects out, basically it accounts for all the assets that the district has. In this particular case, Anoka Hennepin, 45 buildings, 6.3 million square feet, 1,200 acres. That's pretty vast expanse. We basically canvassed the entire area for teams in a methodical way, uh, understanding the condition of the major systems and the finishes, the roofing, the asphalt, the parking, you know, the, the uh, play fields, you name it, we looked at it. We understand the total condition of that school district. Uh, we're able to project this out 25, 30, 35 years, again, whatever you need, we can provide with this custom tool. Easy to use. Uh, if you wanna take it over, that's fine too. We'll give it to you, okay? So basically this is a kind of, uh, it's an abbreviated one because Anoka has got a lot more buildings, but of these buildings here, you can start to understand uh, where the needs are. You see the red under mechanical boiler systems. Uh, there's a thread. So we look at it vertically, building by building by building. We understand the size, the uh, capacity of the building, current enrollment, projected enrollment. So we can see where the trends are in the district. Uh, we can look at the threads horizontally, whether it's air quality, general building exterior condition, general building interior condition, major systems. We have a summary on the bottom. Are you going to need to invest more than 50% of the actual replacement cost of that building? You can see one case there way on the right side, down in the bottom, that little red square. That's significant. We need to understand those types of things so that we can make those big decisions. You know, it's also a planning tool. So we use this, uh, we're in year two of planning uh, using this particular 
integrated system with Anoka. And uh, we're you know, using it to uh, project out into the future. It's very uh, user-friendly as far as moving things around, replanning. You know, a district typically has uh, X amount of dollars. You know, Anoka, they're running about eight and a half million dollars right now, eight million dollars. Sometimes it's less. You can see some million dollar ones out in the future there. Things change. You know, you might have, uh, we understand, maybe about three and a half million dollars. Well, it's a finite amount of money, so it's critical to understand how every dollar is spent. And that's what this tool enables us to do. If I could just add, Dave, that, and that's, these are great tools for the board's understanding. And we did go through years in an Okanop and of a million dollars where just putting a roof on a building was a major accomplishment and not dealing with all the issues we had. So we understand that be, due to the other debt load or whatever else comes up, that you can't always hit those targets. Uh, and we also understand that even though we'll prioritize always roof HVAC windows to protect the envelope of the building and make it safe, that we can't ignore the aesthetics and the, the difference between a 1955 high school and a high school that was built last year and the feeling in the community that we're being left behind because we've got pink bathroom tile, you know, that type of thing. We get that and we get the pressure that you face as a board because I did and our board did as well. And trying to balance those physical needs with the aesthetic needs so the community feels like they're really appreciated that their students all have the same opportunity the students have in newer areas with newer schools. So it, it is a balancing act, but these are great tools to show graphically and, and to community groups and to staff why you're making the decisions you are. So the facility database that Dave and Chuck just talked about, is there a real meat and potatoes of the facility analysis? And we want to develop a, a graphical representation of that information just to make it more comprehensible. If, uh, and so uh, we've overlaid the school plan here in this situation uh, with, with the particular areas that need uh, work. So areas that have a blue outline uh, are just needing finishes updates, areas with a green outline, uh, finishes and casework and other equipment, and ones with a red outline need a uh, remodel. So it gives a kind of overview of what's going on in that school, all key noted so that you can dig into the details a little bit further. And then the color coding of red, yellow, and green indicates um, the urgency, like red is something that needs to be uh, addressed sooner rather than later. Uh, yellow is in a medium term and then green is further out. And we can customize uh, different uh, timelines according to what your district needs. So those are all tools we use. Uh, we obviously use more tools, but those are the big hitters that help uh, help teach you the condition of your buildings with graphic colors instead of some firms write paragraphs that something's really bad. And we do that too, but we also like to graphically show you, graphically show the community uh, because building community trust is a challenge in every district. Every district has the, the naysayers. I've found over my 30 years in educational architecture, it seems to me that 30% of the people, no matter what you do, will vote no. 30% will vote yes, no matter what you do. And you get to work on the middle 40%. And so clear communication, building trust is a great way to start that. And Chuck has done that with us for years. And Chuck, can you speak a little about this? Yes, thank you, Dean. I, it's so important. And I think the tools that Dave and the staff were showing um, are so helpful in getting you to that point. but. And, and with that information, myself, my staff, my board could have made those decisions on which buildings to repurpose, to close, to what areas we needed to build. 
Um, but it would not have been accepted in our community probably any more than it would in yours. What we had to do and what we wanted to do was bring in our community leaders. So we spent a lot of time thinking, let's get parents, teachers. Uh, we had a former mayor. We had city council members. We had real estate agents and others from our community that, that were active, PTO uh, members from our parent teacher organization come in and you know ask them obviously if they were willing to spend some time because we spent about six months with this group this facility task force and staff were only a resource to this group and what we did was present them all the information that, that you've seen tonight along with more information from our transportation director on busing because every bus we add because we're not being efficient with our boundary system and our school placement is a teaching position, essentially. And I'm guessing it's the same in, in Green Bay. So there, that's, it's, it's an expensive consideration, along with community programming, community ed, where, where is the need? Where can we uh, get more four-year-olds involved in our system and three-year-olds? So we had all of those presentations to this large community group and then uh, gave them all the facts and started asking for their input. And not surprisingly, their solutions were the same as ours. I mean, there was a couple schools that we thought maybe we should close and they thought we should keep open, um, but they had another idea for another school that should close. And we actually had the, the former mayor of Coon Rapids up in front of our board recommending closing and repurposing uh, several schools in his city and in tears saying, I hate to recommend this, but it's the right <laughs> thing to do. And when you get that kind of presentation to the school board, uh, though even the naysayers are saying, well, maybe we need to rethink this. So that, that community aspect and getting uh, the recommendation coming from your public rather than your staff to me was the key to the, the success. There are so many pieces to it, but that buy-in uh, made not only the, we had virtually no complaints from the public on the process and our bond, which was the largest at that time in 2017 in the state of Minnesota, 250 million, uh, went through, passed with flying colors, and we had very, very little negative press or comments about any of it. So it, I don't think it could have gone any better, but it, the key again was involving the community. So. And <clears throat> excuse me again. Uh, right. So as Chuck mentioned, you know, bringing the community along and building that consensus is essential. Uh, and to achieve uh, best value design options, we want to help expand your thinking outside of current constraints in order to uh, plan and think about these big ideas. So what we do is we model each option at a district level, like what we just had up there. And then we model it at a uh, building, a school building uh, scale. So that, you know, so that you see, uh, each building, so this here that Dean is showing, can you just scroll through each one? These are different design options uh, for the same building, very different solutions. And these are developed in order to, to generate those conversations. Okay. so. We're going to spend a little bit of time speaking about uh, future reading learning environments. It's something that we like to uh, bring to the facility task force early on and also spend time with your leaders um, speaking about these items because it's one of the inputs um, that help us form decisions. So early on, we like to talk about learning environment principles. These are some things that uh, we think are very important and we like to confirm uh, with the district we're working with too, that these are things you'd like to see in your schools. And over the next couple of slides, we'll go over each of these. Uh, so the first one, is a variety of spaces both in and beyond the classroom. So everybody is unique. We know that learners have different preferences. Uh, education is changing rapidly. It's not just standing 
our teachers standing and delivering information, it's a lot more collaborative than it used to be. So giving students opportunities to work together and have different settings. Being agile and flexible is incredibly important. Here's an, kind of an extreme example where they wanted to erase the walls so they could totally transform the space and have um, divided into single classrooms or uh, blow it out and have a large breakout space um, and just totally opens up all the learning opportunities. Furniture is also flexible and on wheels and easily reconfigurable. Connection to the outdoors is incredibly important. Research tells us this. It's important to be able to see outside, to have access to natural light, to have access to the greenery, and also have access to outdoor learning opportunities. Technology integration, as you guys know, technology is rapidly changing. So just being thoughtful about how we're integrating with technology, that we remain flexible for the future, um, but also supporting all the needs we have today. And then messaging and branding. What is the message that your buildings are sending the people who enter? Are you celebrating learning? What is important to you? What messages are there? And there's lots of different tools we can use um, to do this with windows to be able to see learning, um, also graphics, also me messaging and branding outside. What is uh, making sure there's consistent um, looks between buildings. This is an example. Uh, there's a before picture of what these buildings were before we added a secure entrance. And then we use these, that opportunity to um, really give it a consistent look so people knew what district they belonged to. Another tool we'd like to use um, is this tiered system. So you probably have a lot of buildings that look like this, classrooms lined up along a corridor. Um, so it's just a useful tool in talking about how far we want to take things. So tier one is really just starting to replace furniture and technology in a partial aspect. It could be just some classrooms or it could be a mix of things um, throughout all classrooms for equity. Tier two uh, is really just modernizing what you have, modernizing the classroom. So new finishes, um, new casework, new furniture. Tier three. Um, is really starting to think about the variety of space that's needed in today's learning environments. Um, so starting to break down some walls, giving some opportunities for larger learning environments, for connection, for small group. And then tier four uh, is just really rethinking the space you have. Um, you know, that's a lot of square footage you had with those six classrooms and you can totally transform and just rethink about how you're educating students and how you want to be educating students. So this is an example of how we blew away some interior walls uh, and created and revitalized um, an existing school building. This is a high school. Um, we removed walls and created a new collaboration area and reinvented the space. We also improved their uh, tech, tech ed uh, area with the new STEAM edition. Uh, relocated, enhanced their commons. The commons shown there uh, originally was an uh, interior theater with no windows, no light. We blew, blew that apart and put in skylights and completely revitalized that space, making it feel almost like a, a new school. Uh, and then finally, we uh, also added a fitness room uh, in gymnasium edition. The fitness was a uh, a renovated space that tied into the gymnasium uh, with garage doors that opened in between them, connecting them together. And this is another example of a school where we brought together what we learned from the facility analysis and the education analysis. So looking at this building, it was very interior orientated, lots of interior classrooms with no natural light, uh, demountable partitions with the associated acoustic difficulties between classrooms and uh, a lack of breakout spaces, a lack of small group rooms. So uh, through a process of developing options, we came to this where we inserted uh, skylights into communal uh, breakout areas between reconfigured classrooms and provided some small uh, group rooms as well, uh, just to totally reconfigure and uh, revitalize this uh, inward looking school again with, with a classroom addition as well to provide for the additional space that was needed. Thanks, Pete. So um, the next couple of slides, I'm just gonna talk about a district that um, obviously every district is different, every budget is different, 
Um, and hearing from you last week, it sounded like you have kind of a lot of um, older schools. And so I just wanted to share with you this example. And um, we've been working with this district for the last three to five years. Here's a before picture. Um, and what we did for these classrooms were we didn't move any walls. All we did is change finishes. Um, we added more writable surface. We added technology. Um, some of the principals that Kara spoke to, um, you know, the connection to the outdoors, you can see we did a built-in bench in all classrooms just to have that connection stronger with the kids. We updated the casework, added um, flexible mobile furniture that really helped enhance the space with little to minimal, um, you know, construction. Like I mentioned, no walls were demoed. So I just wanted to share with you um, just something sim simple as finishes can really impact this, um, the child's experience in the space. Um, this district, Kara and I also just um, presented at Ed Spaces, a national conference um, in Pittsburgh. So our client joined us um, in discussing this journey that we've had with them over the last five years. And I, what I wanted to bring to your attention and why I wanted to talk about this um, is just this district also believes strongly in equity. Um, and how we accomplish that throughout their sites. Um, we're creating building standards and also furniture standards. Um, so no matter where at school you enter, um, no matter where it lies, um, you're gonna see the same attention to furniture, the same attention to finishes. And what we also thought was very important um, and just was so impactful was the piloting process. So over 16 months, um, not only did we pilot furniture, um, I believe each site uh, took two classrooms, um, and we piloted furniture and we piloted architectural elements and features. So when it came to the final rollout, we knew exactly what we were doing. We made tweaks um, within that 16 months to our furniture and to our um, construction drawings. Well, I hope that we showed you that we're really built for you. We're built for your project. We've. Uh, We've been doing this for years. As I often say, I've been training my whole career for this job. So I hope we showed you that we know what we're doing. We're respectful, we're hardworking, we're good listeners. We are big thinkers. Uh, we get hired for the jobs that are looking for a good common sense, innovative work. Uh, we're responsible with our design, but we understand, you know, natural light, fresh air, uh, a good feeling space, a space that the staff want to go to work, a space that the students are, are proud to go to school. And that's really what we dedicate our careers to. So we thank you very much for asking us to present to you. We are very, very interested in working for you. And we hope that the, the items that we've shown you uh, relate to what your desires are. So let's think big, let's reinvent, let's revitalize and let's do great things together. Thank you. Well, Dean, thank you very much to you and your team for that uh, very comprehensive presentation. Uh, we've got a few minutes here if any of the other board members have specific questions. Go ahead, Laura. Hi, this is uh, Laura McCoy. Um, so you mentioned a lot, of, uh, a lot of things like messaging, branding, processes, efficiencies, analysis, community buy-in. Um, I'm trying to look at this through the lens of a just a parent in our, our district. Um, and I kind of know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask you to talk um, a little bit about how, how would you tell a parent who, whose only question basically is, how does this affect my child's learning? How can this process and then the, the, the what you might envision, how does this linked to the actual education of my child. So um, I don't know, it, it, I would love to hear what you have to say about that. Kara, I think a lot of what your research and your work does, can you talk about how you 
how you try to improve learning through your design and what you're thinking about and how you can say it affected each person's learning? Yeah. So, you know, those principles that we touched on, really, that is backed up um, by research. So, you know, the why of that is, as I kind of touched on a little bit, but every student is unique and different and learns differently. And, um, you know, it's been exciting, you know, in my time working at ATSNR, really seeing a shift and really seeing that districts, I think the educate or the curriculum and the instruction is really shifting. Um, so it's more personalized. Um, and so we just don't want the building to get in the way. We want the building to support students. We don't want students to feel like they can't learn because they can't hear or because the light is too bright and they're distracted by that. We don't want the building to be a distraction for students. We want it to support students. Um, just the furniture, I can't stress to you enough how important the furniture is. That is the part of the building that the students actually come in contact with. Um, and, you know, it just really is such a useful tool to have, having teachers being able to reconfigure spaces and try different things. So um, I hope that <laughs> answers the question if anyone has anything to add by all means. You know, I've, I've, got, I've got one thing I'd love to add to that. I mean, in addition to that, we'll also, because we have food service design in-house, we'll actually do an analysis of your serving times, for instance. Be out there with a stopwatch, student enters the serving line. How long does it take for them to get through that line and be able to start you know, doing what they really want to do in the cafeteria, and that's enjoy a nutritious meal? And we can look at, at the results of what we do analytically that way, too because less time standing in line allows the student more time to be doing the proper thing in a lunchroom. So there's all sorts of ways to look at it and use that research and the uh, analysis. Thank you. Go ahead, Brenda. Um, one of you just, this is Brenda Warren, hi. Um, one of the situations that you described was in Anoka Hennepin and bringing the community together um, collaborating with the district and the community, um, providing opportunities for the community to advocate. Have you, have you had situations in any of your work where the community and the district are having trouble seeing the same picture or envisioning the same thing? Or have you had um, a situation where you have a split community and, and, um, what what kinds of things did you do to try to bring that back back together again? Because I'm sure that they're not always easy. And I think uh, Chuck, you said that the community more or less agreed with what the staff was moving was um, was bringing forward. And I'm assuming that that's not always the case. Uh, yes, and yes, <laughs> no, it's not always the case. And it wasn't the case for us in the beginning. Uh, you know, very conservative community. Uh, in the southern end of the district with the population pretty stable and the oldest buildings, their main concern was, what's in it for me? I mean, what are you going to do to provide equity for my kids? We don't have brand new buildings. Um, so we really spent a lot of time on, you know, how can we bring in uh, special programming? Can we revitalize these schools and, and uh, new furnishings and, and you know, I can tell those, the parent group that we put a new roof and HVAC system in Coon Rapids Middle School, and they could care less when they go into a classroom that was built in 1955. So, I, yeah, we get it. And it, was, it, it wasn't it was easy, but you bring people along, use all the tools that you saw tonight and explain the process and explain um, you know, how that's going to benefit their child and what, what is in it for them. Coon Rapids High School was built in 1955. We ended up um, really taking a look at the utilization of space and providing a, a new natural light corridor between the uh, gym, gym and, and uh, auditorium and the facility or the main classroom area that brought in all kinds of natural light, makes it a beautiful building aesthetically, and it provided better security for safety between 
areas where kids used to be able and the public used to be able to walk through if they came for a concert into all kinds of classroom areas. But by doing that, it provided more safety, but it made that school look like it was built in 2020 instead of 1955. And it's got beautiful brickwork. So I mean, one example of really listening to those parents' concerns, putting yourself in their shoes. Okay, if I live, if I'm your neighbor and my fifth grader is going to that school, what would I want to see? Um, and I think they heard us and they listened and they knew that we were listening to them and they saw those results. So in the end, and it was a several month process, but after all these meetings, um, we got the parents to understand and we tried to put things into our package that would benefit every community. And I think we did, did that pretty effectively. Dave? You know, Linda, I've got one small point to add on that also. Uh, involving the people that are more skeptical or maybe even the no people in that process is like extremely important because yep. once they start to see really what the issues are and what the opportunities are and what the rationale is and that it's all done properly, um, they can become some of your strongest supporters. Exactly. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, so I don't remember if it was Kara or Sarah, but when you were going through the, the tier one through four changes and the, that, that seemed to make sense to me, I'm wondering about uh, the, the research that goes into, you know, future ready schools. And, um, you know, I think back to some schools that I've been in before back when open concept used to be, you know, the, the latest and greatest and all of these schools were built open concept. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, this actually doesn't work. And now you've got these buildings that aren't designed uh, and, and tough to be effective. And if we're going to be making this kind of investment throughout our entire district, um, what are your thoughts around, you know, wanting to be, you know, schools that are, are ready for, for our learners and, and the style and the way that education is while also not creating buildings that could be uh, irrelevant and difficult to, difficult to utilize in the future? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of the biggest difference between, you know, the open concept of the past and today is, you know, a couple of different things. Uh, one, yes, there are open areas, but it's not all open. You know, we're trying to meet the many, many different needs. Um, you know, in schools, there's need for large group instruction, but there's also a lot more one-on-one -on -one work. There's a lot more group work. There's a lot more collaborative work that's happening. Um, and so we just want to make sure we're giving them all the possible spaces and all the tools that, that support this. Um, you know, we are involved in many uh, national organizations, um, so we're trying to stay up with the latest and greatest of what's what's happening in schools and seeing the research and hearing feedback, um, you know, and also we've tried a lot of these things with our own clients. And while we haven't got like formal research studies, we do, you know, go back and we talk to our clients and we ask what's working and we're, you know, Jen and I were always trying to constantly continually learn and improve and make sure these things that we are doing um, in our buildings are, are right. Um, they don't just look good and they don't just sound good, but they're functioning well for, for, for our clients. If I could add, if I could just add, uh, we did some of those changes, you know, the tier two, three, four that were just shown. And my experience was that some of our newer staff, our newer teachers, we're really open to the collaboration and some of the teachers that had been in the building for 30 years, not so much, um, but it had provided the flexibility to open up. Um, but, you know, what we heard time and again from our teachers was we need, we need privacy to teach. We can't have our two or three classrooms, you know, all in one open space. And, and the options that ATSNR provided us in Anoka Hennepin, provided for that separation of noise so you could separate out but still collaborate when you wanted to and it's been really successful. You know, I'd like to just offer one quick thing and that would be that we don't experiment with you. Uh, every district is unique and uh, what we want to do is make sure that people understand and appreciate the opportunities that are out there no matter what they are. I mean the most the most award-winning 
educational space last year in the United States was a conversion of a locker room that we did at Minnetonka High School. It's called The Loft, five teaching stations. But the way they're put together, like what Kara said about small group, large group, flexible space, they're very traditional, but yet the jury national scale saw it as the most innovative space that should be you know, repeated by other architects. Wow. <laughs> And then just one more thing to add to, I think going back to what Jen was talking about with the pilot classrooms, if you are a little bit unsure, well, try something out. You know, you've probably got a little bit of time now before you're actually going to do any of these projects that um, culminate from this master plan. It's a wonderful opportunity to test things, get your staff comfortable, you know, do some type, some professional development as well, if needed. And if you go to the next slide, Dean, I think that um, space that, or sorry, back, it was the first one in the principles was the one that Dave was speaking to the last. <laughs> Just one of the images. Yep. Hi, my name is Laura Lightning Warren, and my question is, in your experience, what do you typically see as the school board's role in the master planning process? Well, I will take that one. The school board's the one of the keys to it, but we tend to like to put everyone else to work and present a recommendation to you. We do encourage a few of the board members to be part of the process so that there's an intimate understanding um, of the, the level of, of listening and learning. And, and so a few board members uh, tag along with us in the process, but uh, you know, you, your job is to lead the district. Your job is to make the hard decisions. Our job is to do the diligence so that your decision making is sound, so that the, the, the direction you pick has research, uh, community support. Uh, you've looked at everything. And when I say you, if you hire us, we're your architects, which means that we're your agent. We look out for you and your interests, like a lawyer might look out for a client's interest legally. Architects look out for their clients, architecturally, mechanically, physically, like these this image you sh show here. So, um, we need you to, to be, some of you to be part of it. And we then communicate with you with updates and you let us know if we're on the right track or not. But typically it's a track that the community has talked about. So it's being explored. What you decide to do as a final recommendation, or if you decide not to accept the recommendation from the committee, that's your right too. I've had that happen where the board didn't, did, they didn't go with the recommendation, but they used the work that the committee did, uh, created a, a, you know, a system or a project of changes that um, they did and the community supported it. So every, every process is organic and everyone is unique. If I could just add to that, Dean, that's what Dean just described is what we did in Anoka Hennepin and Along with that, we had very frequent school board work sessions with staff to explain where we were in the process. And then as board members, our, our board members were constantly being called or asked questions by members of the community about the process. So they were definitely involved, but they weren't uh, seen as making the recommendations you know, was, we really made an effort to make it not a staff or a board um, process, more of a community process. And I think that's important. Thank you. 
All right. Well, we are at the end of our time, Dean, and uh, to you and the rest of your team, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. Uh, give us a portion of your evening and uh, we will uh, get back to you. Steve and his team will get back to you later this week. Thank you very much. Have a good thank night. You. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. So again, uh, we won't spend time tonight deliberating between the two and analyzing. If you have any uh, specific feedback, uh, please get that to Steve um, throughout this week. And then a recommendation will be brought forward and we can have uh, further discussion at our meeting next Monday. So unless anybody has anything else, I'd look for a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that concludes the work session. Thank you, everyone. You have been watching the Green Bay Area Public School District's Board of Education meeting. Please visit the school district's website, www.gbaps.org, to view the program again. If you cannot fully access the information on this video, please let us know the accessibility issue you are having by calling 920-448-2025 or by email at communications at gbaps.org. We will try to provide the information to you in an alternative format and or make the necessary improvements to make the information accessible. <music>